All right. <laughs> well, it's nice to be here. My name is Ken Gordon. I uh, was in the Colorado legislature for 16 years. I first ran in 1992. Uh, when I ran in 1992, uh, the biggest interest that I had actually was uh, environmental protection. So it's appropriate to be here today. And I looked at the way we finance campaigns in Colorado, and it was clear to me that resource extractors like mining, oil and gas, and real estate developers were making big campaign contributions to the members of the legislature. And I thought, a legislature who's dependent on resource extractors for money to get elected is not going to do a good job protecting Colorado's environment. So when I ran in 1992, I didn't accept campaign contributions from special interest political action committees, and I was the only person elected in either party in the whole state who didn't. And I eventually ran eight different elections, and I never took a contribution from a PAC. Uh, what, what I felt at the time was the money is going to slant the policies that come out of the legislature towards the interests of that money. And uh, I don't think anything actually could be more clear. When I got to the legislature, I saw that it wasn't just in the environmental area, but it was in every other area as well, education, transportation, uh, jobs, uh, tobacco regulation. If there was money on one side, it tended to do better than the other side. So, um, so I've become a very strong uh, opponent of our money-based politics. It doesn't seem like it's democratic to me. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm supporting and help collect signatures to put Amendment 65 on the ballot. And I'm urging you all to vote yes on 65 and to uh, tell other people that you know to vote yes on 65. I'm actually appointing all of you get out the vote captains for your own immediate uh, group of friends, neighbors, and relatives. Make sure that they vote. And a lot of people don't vote all the way down the ballot. So sometimes the ballot measures are very important, and this one is. What Amendment 65 does is it, OK, I have to step back for a second. There have been some Supreme Court decisions that have stepped into this area. The first, the major one, is uh, Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976. Buckley versus Vallejo made an equivalence between money and speech and said that you couldn't limit the amount of money that was spent in campaigns because Congress had actually passed a measure to limit the amount of money spent in campaigns because of the issues that arose during Watergate. Now, this, this is what I think is sort of paradigmatic of free speech. This is a, you've probably seen this before, it's a Norman Rockwell picture. He was an illustrator for the Saturday Evening Post. It's a man expressing his view in a town meeting, maybe a meeting like this, and uh, you know, hoping to persuade people on the merits of his argument. There are some people who make an equivalence between that kind of speech and this kind of speech. This is two piles of money. On the one side is a smaller pile, it says free speech. The other side is a larger pile, and it says more free speech. Now, it's just wrong to make this equivalence. It's true that money does uh, help people uh, express their views during a campaign. So in that way, money has something to do with speech. But to say it's the exact same thing is a mistake. And to give the exact same protections to money as you do to pure speech causes a uh, discontinuity in uh, the way policy is created. Uh, one of the reasons is because money creates an obligation. If I go to a legislator and say, I'd like you to vote uh, yes on a bill because it's the right thing to do, it's appropriate on the merits, that's one thing. But if I go to a legislator and say, I, here's a lot of money, I'd like you to vote yes on this bill, then you're actually not making a decision on the merits, there's an obligation that's created. And it's actually because of that obligation in my view of it that I couldn't take the PAC money when I ran for office. I never wanted to be obligated to somebody other than the people that lived in my district. Okay, so Buckley versus Vallejo was the first case that I'm gonna mention. The second case was decided in 2010. It's Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. And what that case did is it made another equivalence that is not appropriate. That equivalence is between uh, rights for human beings and rights for corporations or unions or other inanimate objects, ideological groups. Um, 
the, the reason why we have individual rights is because uh, individual rights are counter-majoritarian. If you have a right to do something, even if the majority don't want you to do it, you get to do it. And the reason why we have counter-majoritarian <coughs> rights is because our respect for human beings, our respect for their equality, our respect for their dignity. Um, we say they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that's in the Declaration of Independence. But corporations and unions, no offense, were not endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And uh, it's wrong to say that uh, a corporation spending money out of its treasury that was accumulated by people buying a product that had no political uh, input in how the corporation was going to spend that money. Uh, it's wrong to say that that uh, money should have the same protection as an individual expressing what's in their heart and soul. So anyway, those are the two cases, Buckley versus Blay on Citizens United. And what the uh, Amendment 65 does is it urges the members of the Colorado delegation to Congress and the state legislature to support, originally, the members of Congress to refer a constitutional amendment to the states, and then the members of the uh, Colorado legislature to ratify a constitutional amendment that allows Congress and state legislatures to put limits on the amount of money that's spent in campaigns. Yeah. The amendment to the U.S. Constitution? Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So the, uh, we don't consider this to be an easy or short-term <clears throat> project, but what, what it really does is it allows Coloradans to express their view that we need to do something about the amount of money that's spent in campaigns. Now I said that I ran in 1992 without taking PAC money. I looked at the numbers in 2000, wait, in 1980, when uh, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan ran against each other, the <coughs> amount of money spent in the presidential campaign was $92 million. If it had increased at the rate of inflation in 2008, the amount of money that was spent would have been $240 million. But in fact, it was $1.3 billion in 2008. So the amount of money being spent in campaigns is increasing at five times the rate of inflation. And the outcome is that uh, money becomes more important, people's individual vote becomes less important, and the policies are slanted more and more towards money. Uh, politicians, people who are running for office, spend way more time calling people to ask for money than they do actually studying issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and because they're spending time talking to people who have money that they want to get for their campaigns, they become very attuned to the issues that are important to those people that have money. So for instance, uh, a huge issue among con in Congress is how we should treat the capital gains tax. A not very big issue in Congress is what to do with um, perhaps uh, people who have, are trying to stay in homes that are facing foreclosure, because those people don't make campaign contributions. This isn't right, it's not democratic, it's getting worse, and we need to do something about it. And the way to do something about it right now in Colorado is to support this Amendment 65. Um, yes? So, and what it would do, would it actually restrict spending within states? No. Or well, here, this is what it would do. Do you, do you want me to read it? Um, I'll read it. I, have, I brought the text. Go ahead if you want, but I do have the text. Why don't you read it when you're... Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it goes back to these two uh, Supreme Court decisions. One that says money is speech, the other says that corporations, unions, and other inanimate objects have individual rights. Um, because of those two decisions, the Congress, even if it wants to, or a state legislature, even if it wants to, cannot do anything to limit the amount of money that goes to politics. For instance, some of the limitations that are proposed might be something like um, that uh, you can only contribute to a candidate if you can vote for him, if you live in that district. That's something that's proposed, but it would be unconstitutional. Another proposal that I hear sometimes is that campaigns shouldn't be two years long, <coughs> it should be a shorter period of time. But that would also be unconstitutional because it would be considered to be a violation of free speech. Or uh, a matching fund proposal that says that um, we're going to give money to public money to a candidate who, uh, if the other candidate takes PAC money, 
uh, that would also be considered unconstitutional. So anything that you do to try to even the playing field or give people an equal political voice right now is considered unconstitutional. So the idea is to pass a constitutional amendment. The citizens can't pass a constitutional amendment. It has to pass first through Congress and state legislatures. So this is expressing our view that we want our elected officials to support some kind of a constitutional amendment to deal with money and, and speak and politics. Yeah. Is there, <clears throat> is there some sort of contractual obligation that's um, created when you take money from a PAC? No, it's not contractual. It's, uh, what it is is it's, um, first is normal human gratitude, you know, if you, uh, need that money to get elected and somebody gives you that money and then they call you later you're going to be more inclined to answer their phone call than you would somebody who didn't help you and second if you ever want to run for election again you need to vote in a way to make sure that the people who contributed to you the first time feel positively about you and will contribute to you the next time it's not contractual but if you and, and a lot of candidates will stand here and say I take the money but it has no effect on me well that's a lie Money has an effect on everybody. Money, just like anything else, money talks. Uh, so, and, and you know, it's like the tobacco companies used to say, well, there's no proof that smoking causes cancer. And the politicians will say, you can't prove that I voted that way because I got money. <coughs> Look at the side of the issue where that gives all the money. They get more votes than the side that doesn't. So you can prove it epidemi epidemiologically. You can't show what's in the mind of any particular candidate. But those of us who are there, who've seen it, know that the money talks. And in fact, I've heard candidates say, I mean elected members of the legislature say, I can't vote that way because of a contribution that they got. They're just telling me. They're not telling the people that live in their district. But it's obvious when you're there. It's obvious when you're debating something. Um, like the people might come to a, a hearing where they express their view in front of a committee, but the real meeting took place earlier around coffee mm -hmm. where the funders came and talked to the uh, members of the committee beforehand, and that's where it really got decided. So I guess I'm still a little bit confused, because I understand all of this <coughs> decisions, and I understand the impact of money in campaigns, but so if this were to pass, it doesn't actually really do anything. Just this is what it does. Right. It's, it's, more, it's more or less a statement, but it can be used in this way. Let's say that 75% uh, of the people in Diana to get district vote in favor of this. And then the bill comes up. Uh, those who advocate for it, like Common Cause or my organization, Clean Slate Now, can go to Representative Gutt and say, uh, Representative Gutt, 75% of the people in your district want you to vote in favor of this. Mm -hmm. And then if she doesn't, it can, it'll be used in a campaign against her. Uh, this being a constitutional amendment. We want you to vote in favor of a constitutional amendment to uh, to do something about Citizens United and Buckley versus Buckley. Like I said, it's bad, it's getting worse, it's taking us away from democracy. Uh, what we can do is limited because of the Supreme Court decisions. This is something we can do to express our view. And by the way, um, with, in the original Constitution, United States Senators were not popularly, popularly elected. They were appointed by <coughs> legislatures. In the early part of the 20th century, we switched that. And one of the ways it was done was by this kind of uh, voter instructions to elected officials saying, we want you to vote for that constitutional amendment. So this has been done before. But has, has this type of uh, amendment been tried before? I mean, to amend the well, I think there was a big impetus when Citizens United passed in 2010 that gave um, individual human rights to people, to groups that weren't individuals. And since that time, there have been a lot of proposals to amend the Constitution. There may have been some before, I'm not aware. Um, I don't know if I have my facts exactly right, but I mean, what are the chances of Congress and half of our millionaires would really vote the way we want? This is what I want. I want to be able to go to uh, Congress people and say 75% of the people in your district just voted for you to vote this way and then if they don't I want to be able to use that in the next election against them. It's a, it's a pressure point. 
it's, it's like, let's do something, this is what we can do. You know, let's not passively let our democracy brought by the highest bidder. Well, it, it actually, uh, what it mostly does is it, it's a statute, but it also does amend one word in the state constitution because we passed um, voluntary spending limits several years ago, and this changes, it takes out the word voluntary. So it does actually amend the constitution, but it doesn't, in order to really, in order to, no, no, like I said, in, in order to make a change, we have to change the United States Constitution because we're dealing with the United States Supreme Court decisions. It's <coughs> on the ballot in Colorado and Montana, but what we're trying to show in Colorado and Montana is that the people care about this, that they're worried about money in politics, and they want to do something about it. You know, is there a, there's a minimum number of states that if they propose a constitutional amendment, it has to be acted on? Or there there's, two ways, there's two ways to amend the United States Constitution. One is through a piece of legislation in Congress that passes with two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate, which is then referred to the states, and the state, three-quarters of the states have to ratify it. The other way is for two-thirds of the states to call for a constitutional convention. There's never been a constitutional amendment that's happened through the second way. It always is, goes through Congress first. And if we could hold on. Uh, yeah, let's let Ari speak yeah, for a little while. Yeah, we'll have more questions. Yeah, and then, then we can both take questions. Because you should hear the other side. That's why we brought him. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot for having me. Um, you're spending your lunch hour debating, listening to the debate about these campaign issues, which is kind of extraordinary in itself, I think. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here with Ken. Obviously, Ken is a guy who throws his life, his passion, his energies into the causes he believes in, and I admire him for that reason. However, on this cause, I think that what he's advocating is extremely dangerous, and I think we ought to think carefully about the potential harms of this before we rush headlong into supporting it. Now, I think he did it, he gave a pretty good summary of what the language is about. I brought the, the actual language, if you want me to read it later, just ask me. But I think he did a pretty good job summarizing what its intent is. There's a basic choice before us here. And the basic choice is between free speech, as outlined in the First Amendment, right? We already have a constitutional amendment at the federal level pertaining to speech. It's called the First Amendment, the heart of the Bill of Rights. We have the ch that protects each individual's right to speak their minds as much as they want, as effectively as they can or and are able, whether individually or as part of the group. <laughs> the only alternative to free speech as the First Amendment sets it up, is putting government in charge of restricting speech, meaning politicians and bureaucrats, which means that the government gets to decide who's able to speak, or how they're able to speak, or what they're able to say. The proper name for that kind of system is censorship. So the basic choice we have is free speech or censorship in some form. I have <coughs> free speech. Now, Ken's central argument, and different proponents emphasize different aspects of this, but it seems to me that Ken's central argument is the corruption argument. Money in politics corrupts politicians because they feel obliged to vote a certain way or advocate certain policies because certain people are funding their campaigns. I completely agree that this is a real and alive problem. In fact, I spend some of my time reading from the public choice school of economics. So right now I'm reading a book called Beyond Politics, and it's about this very problem. So this is a big concern for free market economies, and in fact there's a whole school of economics about this. It's mostly based on George Mason University, so you might be interested in that book. I'm sure you'll disagree with a lot of, a lot of those pictures. So I agree that this is a problem. Money tends to corrupt the political process, at least in many spheres in many cases. But it is a bad argument to say that there is corruption in politics because of money to lead from that to the idea that we should therefore have censorship. Quite the opposite. There are two huge problems with that argument, that corruption justifies censorship. The first problem is this. 
Well, Ken Gordon is talking about all the bad people, the evil people, the people with the horns on their heads, right, who are financing the bad sorts of policies, in other words, the policies that Ken disagrees with. And these are the bad people. We want to shut them up. If only they would be quiet, then we could restore our democracy. And it's tr I totally grant that some people are, are giving money to campaigns and for lobbying so that they can get special favors. Mm -hmm. They want to get corporate welfare, subsidies. They want to get special protections against their competitors. This is a real problem. It happens. I grant that. But what about all the people who are speaking their minds because they believe in their ideas. As hard as it may be for Ken to believe, there are people who actually refer to, quote, resource extractors as energy producers. And they think that this is a great and wonderful thing. In fact, they think that it is the backbone of the American economy and that energy is fundamentally important to our lives in a civilized and industrial society. Okay, so one person's nasty speech is another person's ideological crusade. So, and even if we move to any topic, right, people have disagreements about what are the proper policies, what are the proper philosophical foundations. So what Ken is proposing is a broad censorship law that says it's going to shut up all the camps of people, whether they are trying to get special favors or whether they just are trying to speak their minds because they really believe it. And there's a lot of people like that. The next problem with the corruption argument is this. If you're saying the problem in politics is corruption, therefore we should have censorship, who's writing the censorship laws? It's the exact same politicians that we're claiming are corrupt by money. So we're going to let politicians pass the censorship laws to restrict speech critical of politicians, those same politicians. Talk about self-dealing. This is inherently corrupt to let politicians censor the, their critics. And that is a major reason why we have the First Amendment to begin with. These same special interests who are corrupting the political process, do you think that they're going to somehow go away when they're passing these censorship laws? Indeed not. The same special interests are going to have a seat at the table when it comes to writing these laws. So who are these laws actually going to protect? Two main groups the incumbent politicians, because, hey, we don't want those nasty peasants criticizing us. How dare they criticize us politicians? We need to shut them up. And the other group it's going to protect, it's protect are the special interests who are influencing these politicians. If you have a seat at the table, you are going to find yourself with special exemptions to these censorship laws. If you don't have friends in high places, you are going to receive the brunt of this new bureaucratic state. If, we're t if we impose censorship, what is the standard here? Again, some people's special interest group is another person's freedom fighter. What about corporations? What about nonprofit corporations? What about media corporations, such as the Denver Post, Fox News, ABC News, etc.? Are media corporations going to be exempt from the censorship laws? That doesn't sound like equality to me. What that sounds like is that some speakers are now more equal than others. What about unions? Are unions to be stripped of your rights of free speech? Look, it is true that a corporation is not a person. It is true that a union is not a person. That's obvious. However, it is equally obvious and true that a union is a group of people, as is a corporation or any group. Now, I know this is just a slip, so I don't want to be you know, too hard on this, but he referred to a union as an inanimate object. Clearly, that's just as wrong as saying that a union is a person, right? You're not an inanimate object. You're a group of people. I see that. I see you're eating illegal peats. I see you joking around. I see you giving us quiz quizzical looks, right? You're not an inanimate object. You're a group of individuals. You do not lose your individual rights by virtue of joining a group. If we're going to have censorship laws, what sorts of talk, speech are we going to censor? Well, we all agree. If you say, if you send out a big uh, mailer that says, I love Ken Gordon, vote for Ken Gordon, assuming you were running again, that would be clearly advocating a candidate. But what if I just say, Ken Gordon or candidate X, he promotes these really great policies, or if you don't like them, really terrible policies. Right? Or what if you just talk about philosophy? 
this candidate supports these philosophical ideas that I agree with or disagree with. All of a sudden, we're talking about censorship of discussion of philosophical ideas. What if a corporation decides to publish a book critical of a candidate, which was an issue raised with the Citizens United <coughs> case, as an example? Are we all of a sudden going to have the government censors rounding up the prohibited books and having a bonfire? That's what we're talking about. Prohibiting groups from speaking out using their resources. Now another argument in favor of Amendment 65 is that this, this will somehow protect the little guy. That is the opposite of the truth. If you look at Ken's posters, the people with the money are the exactly the people who are going to fare well under these types of laws. Pat Stryker is worth $1.4 billion. She has spent millions of dollars in politics here in this state. Pat Stryker can afford to hire all the legal advice and help she needs to weave herself through all the inevitable loopholes in these laws. Who cannot afford to hire the attorneys and fight this bureaucratic red tape? It is precisely the little guy, the small groups. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Citizens United, the actual group on, after which the Supreme Court was named. A relatively small group of relatively small independent donors. They decided, hey, we don't like Hillary Clinton. We're going to come out with a documentary criticizing Hillary Clinton. The federal government said, no, we're, we censor your speech. They took it to court and eventually won. Thank goodness. <coughs> But this is not, you know, this is not one of these giant corporations protecting the resource extractors, right? This is a group that thinks that Hillary's ideas are wrong and they want to say so. Or here in Colorado, under the existing campaign restrictions in Colorado, in Parker North, there was a small group of citizens that wanted to spend a few hundred dollars, okay, a few hundred dollars literally, to say, well, we don't, we just approve of this annexation effort. What do they get for their troubles? Their political opponents drag them into court under these campaign laws and tied up, tied up their resources for months and indeed years as this, court, as this court case went through the courts. For spending a few hundred dollars, this is the kind of person who gets ensnared by these sorts of restrictions. A personal example, one of my friends and I have spent the last two election cycles fighting the personhood better, if you remember what that was about. It's not on the ballot this year, because they didn't get enough signatures. We combined, on both election <coughs> cycles combined, spent just over $3,000. Okay, this is not big corporate big corporate money, okay? We, rate, we, we raised and spent a little over $3,000. My friend had to spend hour upon hour upon hour registering with the state, filling out all these forms, staying out until the early hours of the morning, literally trying to gather and collate the correct information and submit it to the proper bureaucrat so that she didn't get dragged into court by her political opponents. And at, at a certain point she said, I have had enough. I'm going to stop raising money to advocate my beliefs in a woman's right to choose to get an abortion because the bureaucratic hassle of speaking is too great, it's <coughs> too high, and I'm not going to do it anymore. I have seen firsthand that these sorts of restrictions chill free speech. They don't chill the free speech of the people with millions of dollars. They chill the free speech of the little guy. I want to read, I'm just going to read you a quick quote from a guy who's in the state senate named John Morse. He supports these campaign restrictions, but he and I attended a Secretary of State meeting last year. Here's what he had to say about the existing restrictions. It turns out that complying with all this is complicated and really does take a lawyer. So who is this hurting? The people with millions of dollars who can afford all the legal help they could possibly get? Or the small groups who do not have the money to hire the high-powered attorneys to go to these bureaucratic meetings, to go to court for them, and get them through all these bureaucratic hurdles? Seriously, these laws do not hurt the big money donors. They're, you're not going to stop them. I'm sorry. What you're going to do is allow people's political opponents to drag them into court and shut them up. That's what this is about, shutting people up that you disagree with. And that will be the result of that. Look, nothing Pat Stryker does or any other rich person does or any rich corporation does can hurt my ability to speak. Pat Stryker's millions of dollars has not infringed my right to speak one I own none. I have, and if anything, all these people spending money gives me more stuff to talk about. And their people are more interested, so they're more willing to listen to the little guy. But I do have something to be afraid of when it comes to my ability to speak. One thing, just one thing, and that is the government censor. The person who has the ability to drag me into court, to fine me, 
to per prosecute me under the law, ultimately to lock me in a metal cage. That is the only thing that could stop me from speaking, is the government censor. And so I really encourage you to, to not look at the problem of corruption and say, therefore, censorship. That's only going to make these problems much, much worse. And with that, I think, I'm sure Ken has some retorts. And so, I don't know, if, how do you, do you want to do questions yeah, with do, me or do you yeah, want to do Ken's first? Why don't we do questions of either one of you? Yeah. Okay. Another question is, if, if as is apparently the case, that money is free speech, and corporations have the right to speak with their money. If a politician doesn't accept contributions, is he somehow denying that corporation's right to address or communicate with their elected officials? Is that a violation of the no, Constitution? No, no, certainly not. I mean, look, you can speak, you can go to speak to them, but my right to speak does not impose any right, any obligation for anybody to listen to me. Right? You can tune me out right now. Well, doesn't, the, doesn't an elected official have an obligation to listen to, the, to its constituents? And doesn't you, you, a constituent have a right to address? I mean, we can talk about le your, what they're legally required to do versus what maybe they're morally required to do. I mean, I think, yeah, I think an elected official has a moral requirement to listen to what his constituents are concerned about. But really, you don't think there's a, a constitutional right for them to... Well, be there's able? also the idea... No, the constitu what, yeah. what the right is, is for you to vote against him if he doesn't right. listen to you. Really? That's it? That's it. Well, that's a lot. But the, well, I know, but, but I thought there was some uh, inherent right of the, the citizens to redress their grievances with their government. Is that only there, there's, the a, there's a right to petition your government. Okay. But there's no requirement. In fact, you know, most many elected officials don't listen to the people that live in their districts. Really? <laughs> I mean, the reason they don't is because so they don't because your votes don't matter very much compared to the checkbooks of their big contributors. But I, I think honestly, I think you're a little bit overly cynical. I was there. I was in the legislature for 16 years. I was a minority leader in the House. I was a majority leader of the Senate. I've worked on national and statewide campaigns. And I've seen how money distorts the system. It just absolutely does. Anyone who doesn't think that has not been paying attention. Well, I, I see that, but I also see elected officials attending local events, talking to their constituents. I am quite positive that, that if I call Evie Hudak, who's in my area, and try to schedule a meeting, I will be successful. Let me, um, let me, let me don't say. you also feel like the amounts of money that are getting poured into the campaign are in their own way censoring candidates from being able to say what they really think because they're saying what the people who are giving the money want to hear as they're opposed to what them. their real thoughts and beliefs are. And so isn't it having sort of, I mean, isn't that in itself also censorship? What, what, Eric, what Eric is saying is that what I'm proposing, which is the ability of Congress or state legislatures to set some limits on how much money goes into political campaigns or how it goes in, he, he says that's censorship. He says, I'm providing censorship. What I'm saying is that he's defending bribery because the money has, it, it isn't just I want to advocate on the merits of my position. Because if that was, if you're trying to win on the merits, you wouldn't have to give a lot of money. It's I know the merits don't support me well enough, so here are the merits and here's some money too, so you'll vote with me. And that's not good. That's not right. And the First Amendment protects speech, and I'm actually a fairly strong proponent of protecting speech. I just don't say that money given to candidates is the same thing as speech. See, it's just it, it has this extra um, ability to create an <coughs> obligation that speech doesn't. And then Cindy's had her hand up for a while. I was just wondering what both of you thought about having, you know, either a two-prong approach on your <coughs> thing while we go down this long road of constitutional amendment and your your views of <coughs> not wanting the government involved in anything, about following, at least getting rules in place now about disclosing who is contributing <laughs> all this money. Um, that's, it, it, that's an interesting question because I've been advocating for limits on the amount of money that can go in for many years, and my opponents always said, no, we should just disclose everything and let as much money go in as possible. 
and the Republican Party and their national platform always was in favor of disclosure. But since Citizens United passed, and because of another case called Speech Now, uh, money can go into super PACs that is not disclosed. It can come from anywhere we don't know. Uh, the Republican Party took out disclosure from their uh, platform, and now they're not even in favor of disclosure because they're getting undisclosed money. So, well, and I'd well, like to hear your perspective on that. Okay, so there's a couple things on the table. I'd first like to take the bribery point and then circle back around to this disclosure issue. Obviously, literal bribery. If I, if, if you're in office and I hand you ten thousand dollars cash and I say vote for this bill for the ten thousand dollars, clearly that's already illegal, right? That's you go to prison for that. So that sort of direct bribery is illegal. But there is this sort of indirect metaphorical bribery, right, where some group is spending a lot of money on an election in the hope it's not an obligation, right? <coughs> the candidate will vote their way. And this is again, I grant this is a problem, but I think that it's. I think Ken is presenting an overly simplistic case. It's not the case that outside groups get, give money to a candidate or pay for their for campaign messages, and then the candidate just says, oh, well, I'm going to vote your way because you spent money on my campaign. Sometimes it works that way. Often it does not. Often a group is giving money to a candidate because they know the candidate already agrees with them. Believe it or not, some people have ideological convictions, and these don't change because they get elected to politics or for whatever reason. Um, in terms of listening to the voter, I think that we would acknowledge that even within a small district, a lot of people are going to disagree. So if a politician is listening to one person say, I want higher taxes, another person wants lower taxes, you, have to ch you, you can't have higher and lower taxes at the same time, right? You cannot, Im you cannot implement the wish of everyone simultaneously. That's, that just isn't politically impossible. And so about this spending money, right? What is the difference between a, a bad special interest group spending money to sway their a politicians vote to do the wrong thing versus a citizen activist group who's spending money to persuade a politician to do the right thing. Often, the difference in those perspectives is simply which side of the issue you agree on. So I think it's kind of dangerous to say, well, they're the villains, they're the devils, they, we need to shut them up because they're the bad guys, right? Often, they, see that they say the same thing about the other side. So what it ends up is whoever has the power gets to shut up their opponent. And that's maybe what you're saying, but but isn't, what you're saying then is it because money is free speech and free speech is okay to influence a politician, it's okay that a politician is influenced by the money he gets from a corporation or anything. I'm saying, well, I'm saying it happens, but can, can I, just, yeah, go ahead. but it's I'm also, sorry. look, it's not like there's a one-to-one -one relationship, right? If Group X spends, you know, $1 million on this candidate's campaign, he's going to get, you know, an additional 3.4% of the votes in their direction. This is not how it works. It's often the case that politicians, that people who spend a lot of money on elections lose, right? It's often the case that people spend a lot of money on causes that go down in flames. So we're not just mindless autom automatons, right, who are at the mercy of the, these external forces, right? We have minds, we have a brain, we can evaluate things, we can make decisions, we can look at which ideas are the best. And so, you know, this idea that censorship is some, somehow gonna help this problem, all it's doing is it's preventing people from criticizing the system that they disapprove of. And what do you think about disclosure yeah. requirements? <coughs> I'll get, I'm sorry, I'll get, I'll, I'll get to disclosure. Gary says that I'm being simplistic when I equate the money that's being given to candidates for their campaigns as bribery, and that he's not being simplistic when he says that when I say we should put limits on the amount of money that goes into politics, when he calls it censorship. You know, um, let, me, let me just say this. One of the things that Ari said is that they, they don't give money because they want to get extra influence that you don't have. They give it because they're supporting someone who has their values. Well, I've recently done this, and it's sort of an interesting thing to do. I've looked at Diana DeGette and Doug Lamborn's campaign contributors. Then I made a list of people that contributed to both of them. I did the same thing with Michael Bennett and Lisa Murkowski, who's a Republican in Alaska, just to find a generic Republican. There are pages and pages of people that contribute to people who are on the far opposite ends of the spectrum. They're not doing it because they support the values of those people because they don't have the same values. They're doing it because they want influence later when whoever gets elected uh, gets into office. Uh, contributors will give money to the winner after they previously supported the loser in a oh. campaign. Why would they do that? 
they also give money in campaigns where there's no opposition. Why would they do that? The reason they give to both sides or the winner after they previously scored these or because there's no opposition is because they're buying influence. Can, can I just do like a one minute just kind of synopsis of this? Because I, sure. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that we're... Yeah, we're, we're very close to the time. So why don't, if you want you each do your, like, you know, quick... Uh, you want to make it Closing argument. Yes. Closing argument. I'm actually willing to let you have the last word. Whatever. Okay, so Harry's going to have the last word. All I'm going to say is, um, I've seen this a problem. I mean, I think if you watch policy created in the United States, if you watch the health care reform, for instance, you saw that pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies had a disproportionate influence over how that came out. We didn't get a public option because that would have taken away business from the insurance companies. So the insurance companies are big players. The banks have a huge amount to say about how uh, the rules about investment and deposits and insurance are uh, created, rules about foreclosure. Uh, oil and uh, coal companies have a lot to say about what we're going to do, if anything, to keep carbon out of the air. Uh, the reason why these groups have a lot of influence is because they have a lot of money which they spend on campaigns. So the outcomes are not good for people, and they're not good in ways that actually matter and are important. So our system is broken right now. It's not working. I'm saying we should do something to limit this money influence. I'm not against merit influence. If the oil companies have an argument on the merit that's, that they can win with, they should. Uh, but if they're just trying to win because they're giving more money, then I'm against that. So this is what I would say to Harry. I would say um, if this effort to try to reduce the influence <coughs> is something that you can't support, is there anything that you can support to address this issue? Or do you think we should just give up, let money control how the outcomes come from Washington? Uh, or do you have some other method of dealing with it? Because I'm all ears. So Ken and I agree on an important problem, which is that in many cases, money corrupts the political system. We agree there. However, so why here's where we, we take money out of the political system altogether. Why, why stop halfway? You'll get your chance. <laughs> but this is part of the. But this is part of the. The, the, the broader the broader answer is censorship is inherently wrong. It's wrong to violate someone's right of free speech whether they're a billionaire or a hundredaire, okay? But, but if we're talking about the solution to this problem of corruption, now this is a very large issue, which I obviously cannot give you the answer in my final minute. I do have some <coughs> ideas on, on real solutions to try to solve this, to, to address this problem anyway. And I know based on what he said before, we have some disagreements on even what the, co the ultimate causes are of this problem and certainly of what to do about it. But I'm going to suggest this, granting the problem and, and saying we can't solve that problem in the next minute. Imposing censorship is only going to make that problem worse. Because the big money, the big money people are the very same people who are going to be advantaged by the censorship laws. They're going to use the laws to shut up their opponents. All these censorship laws are going to do is make it more difficult for the critics, the critics of this corrupt system, to make their voices heard. They're going to be the ones ensnared in, these, in this bureaucratic red tape. So ultimately, I, we agree with the problem. The Ken's solution is only going to make the problem worse. And that is my fear. So, so. we're out of time. Yeah. I want to thank you very much. And please, yeah.